Today I'm going to be working on this, which is actually a fixture for a fixture. Today I'm going to be working on a fairly simple little part. This is just an aluminum piece that's meant to raise another fixture high enough up and hold it in the vertical position instead of the horizontal position clamping it uh, well into the vise. So as I said, it's a very simple part to make, but I thought you might be interested in the whole process. Let me back up and explain the motivation for the riser. What I'm showing you is the previous fixture. This is designed to fit onto the fourth axis. And the idea is that when it's sitting on the fourth axis, it's rotated like this. It can mill these parts and then I could mill the holes there. I don't have to mill the holes here anymore because those are now in the 3D printed part. I still have to do this. But this meant that I had to rotate this until basically using a dial indicator until I could tell that these were both the same height, which was a little bit hard to do, especially because these are not always exactly straight. And then I realized there was a much easier way. There's a locating feature right here that is actually used in this fixture here. So this fixture, if I hide this, let's see, it's right here. You can see there's a notch here that aligns that 12 o'clock mark that's in the watch itself. And so what I realized is if I changed the order of operations and milled this while it was still in this fixture and I actually made that the first operation and oriented it like this, that would make things a lot easier. It would be registered automatically with the correct rotation and I wouldn't have to do anything extra. And that's where I came up with this idea of creating a riser block that will raise this up in the vise so that it clears the front of the vise. And you'll see in a, little, a bit later that I didn't get this quite right. And then I can just mill this directly. Once I mill that, I can take it out of the vise and put it into the vise like this and then mill this part of it. So it's much easier to do those first two operations by keeping the part on the fixture in between those operations rather than having to change fixtures for every single operation. I use a bandsaw to cut my material, which means that the ends, both the one you see and on the other side, are still rough. And so I manually clean it up by taking passes that have a width of cut of about 10 thousandths of an inch. And I'm doing it with multiple depths so that I'm not putting too much load on this end mill on this light machine. Then I can take it out of the vise, deburr the end that I just cleaned up, flip it over, and then tighten it. Now I found that if I tighten it once and then loosen and tighten it again, it tends to sit down better. And then a quick hit with a dead blow hammer and then making sure that it's tight on the parallels. And then to precisely cut it to the correct width, I start by setting the probe to the approximate back left corner. It doesn't have to be exact. I'm going to set the, the part zero for X and Y. And then when I start the cycle, it'll come in using that approximate location to probe the two faces. And this will pick up the exact location. So at this point, it knows exactly where that left back side is. The 2-inch tri-fly from Shrum Solutions does a really great job of decking off the top. I'm cutting about 10 thousandths of an inch, and this gives me a very smooth surface finish. Now I'm using the program to clean up the other end, and this will also set the width to exactly what I want, or at least within probably 1 thousandths of an inch. I need to clean up these sides as well. These will become the top and the bottom. So I put this into the vise, give it a good whack. It wasn't quite tight enough, so I had to give it a second whack. And then I'm bringing the tri-fly down until I can feel it touching the edge. And then I know when it's at about Z0. Once it's there, I can back it up. And then I can start to manually move it across to clean up the surface. Again, I'm taking off about 10 thousandths of an inch, and the width does not have to be precise, so after doing this, I flipped it over and repeated on the other side. Then I can open up the vise a little bit wider so that I can fit this back into the vise in the orientation where I'm going to do most of the milling. So I put it in and tighten it, 
And then I realized what I wanted to do is to center it up between the graduations because then I can flip it over and put it back in. And that will put it in a close enough position so that the probe can pick up the back left without me having to reset the zero position in the probe as I'm doing here. And then after that, it'll probe automatically. So even when I flip it over, this probing cycle will work exactly the way I want it to. And then I can start the milling of the actual shape. Here I'm doing adaptive clearing. So this is the roughing operation using a 3 8 inch diameter Aluma Power end mill. Right about here, I had this realization that I think the part may be too far down in the vice jaws, and therefore, if I kept going, it might hit the vice jaws. So I got out a scale and took a look and confirmed that, yes, indeed, I don't have enough clearance. And so therefore, I had to pull it out, and then I moved it up to the piranha jaws, which have a much lower profile gripping, and therefore give me the clearance that I needed to be able to continue. And because of this, I changed work offsets and decided to use the top as well as back left. So first I had to probe the top, and then we can probe the back and left, as you can see here. I just re-ran the previous program, which meant to cut in the air for quite some time until it got down to cutting new material, as you see here. And it didn't take very long to finish this. And then finally we do the 2D contour at the very end to produce a nice, very clean, very shiny looking wall. And then finally, a chamfer all the way around, which both breaks the sharp corners and also produces a nice pleasing appearance. And then I can flip it over back onto the parallels and into the center again, whack it to make sure it's uh, firmly seated, probe the top again, and now you'll notice that I'm probing the back right, and that's because it's the same edge that I probed before, but because I flipped it over, it's moved to the other side. And then pretty much the same thing, some more adaptive roughing to remove the material. And then once we've done that, come back for a 2D contour to produce a nice clean surface. And a final chamfer to clean up the edges. So it turns out I should have made this a little bit wider than I did because I had to put a parallel underneath it to raise it up. If I didn't, it turns out that this fixture was hitting against the vice jaws or the watch body was hitting against the vice jaws. Once I raised it up like this, then you can see that it takes a little bit of work to get it in there because it wants to fall over. But you can see that the watch body fits in there nicely. And this is exactly what I wanted to be able to do with it. I actually have enough material for five videos. I've been just trying to get some things done and that's been making it difficult to finish the, the videos. But I'll be getting to those other videos uh, really soon. The next video is going to be probably using this riser block or it may be redoing the video that I had of the three point um, probing because I discovered that what I was doing was not completely correct. It was following the manual, but it wasn't correct. I talked to Renishaw and have the information that I need to make a video on how to do it correctly. And then I have uh, using this as well as some other videos that are collaboration with another YouTuber and I'll talk about that later. I want to thank my Patreons for supporting me. Please subscribe, give me a thumbs up, comment below, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.